We can start. Had a very full morning and now they have a full stomach. So, but we are hoping that this session will be interesting. So, please do come in and, and take your seat. Uh, this session is about success factors of Asian um, media organizations. My name is Daisy Anwar. I'm with CNN Indonesia based in Jakarta, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to. Uh, the session, and for those of you who have come from abroad, to, welcome to Jakarta, to Indonesia, and I hope that, you know, the, we've had a nice and pleasant trip, but let me just uh, give a little bit of an introduction when we talk about a success uh, factor of an Indonesian media organization. Now, I myself have been in the media for quite a long time. As a matter of fact, I started my career when Indonesia only had one state-owned television, and that was in, in the 90s. I know I'm, I'm a lot uh, older than I look, trust me. One private, um, one state-owned television, that's when I started. And then we had RCTI, which is the channel that I worked with, was the first private television station. At that time in the 90s, Indonesia was under President Suharto. If you remember, it was under the New Order regime. Everything was uh, very top-down and it, there was no democracy. Everything was uh, very regulated, a lot of censorship. But in the five years when I started with RCTI, there were five television uh, stations that sprung up, mainly because it was a good business model. Now, Indonesia's, the owner of RCTI then was the son of President Suharto. So it was actually set up not for democratic purposes, but for business purposes. And in 1998, when Indonesia actually, we had what we called reformasi, our reform, there were already six national television stations. And Indonesians by then were used to getting their information and their entertainment from television. Over 80% of Indonesians uh, rely on television for their information. And fast forward, when we had our reformasi, we had the beginning of the democratization of the country as well as the opening up of the freedom of the press. And by then, Indonesia, we had 10 national television stations, plus many, many local televisions, not to mention many newspapers, lots and lots of uh, magazines and local uh, media springing up. And of course, with the advent of technology, we also had a lot of online media as well as the growth and the birth of the social media. Indonesia has one of the world's highest users of Facebook and Twitter. So when we talk about the success factors of the media uh, in Indonesia, it's a con constantly ever-changing and shifting landscape because of the constantly changing political landscape, in this case, the democratization, as well as the receptance to new technology. Now, I'd like to uh, start the session by asking our uh, panelists. Here we have four very distinguished panelists. Um, Maria Ressa, a very, also an, an old friend of ours. Now she's the CEO and executive uh, director of Rapla, which is an online media kit. But Maria had been with, uh, for a long time with CNN as a bureau chief in Manila, and then we also have Pramesh Chandran, who is now the CEO of Malaysia Kini, of course, from Malaysia. 10 million um, followers, or you know, eyeballs, as we call it. And we also have Krishna Sen, not in the media, but she is the, what we call an Indonesianist. Apparently, she's the only professor in Australia who can speak Bahasa Indonesia. Oh, the only dean of the Faculty of Art for the University of Western Australia. So uh, we're very happy to, uh, to have you. And of course, last but not least, Bambang Harimurti, the chief editor of Tempo magazine. Also, you know, with a 
long history and understanding of the Indonesian media landscape. Now, let me just start off the discussion with you, um, Maria, and, and, and everybody else. Just, uh, how, uh, when we talk about the success factors, you know, what can you tell us, uh, particularly in your own experience in the Philippines, and how has the media landscape shifted, particularly in the last decade, and how has it actually made you and uh, your job as a journalist, um, you know, basically having to uh, evolve as well as adapt to the new and forever shifting landscape? Thanks, Desi. It's so, so nice to be back in Jakarta. Um, so for us, it's like the rest of the world, everything is moving online and uh, social media is a key factor to it. And along with that comes a lot of different things. Um, I'm a traditional journalist, or I was. Um, I was with CNN for 20 years, and then I handled the largest news group in the Philippines for six years. But in 2012, I thought that technology was going to play a key factor into on whether or not traditional media would survive. First, on the business model, and second, in the way we do our work. Right. how we grow our communities, what role we play in societies. So Rappler, we started in 2012. Uh, it's the discipline of traditional journalism, but you tie it together. If you look at the Venn diagram, the second one is uh, technology. And then the third part, which is something we never used to do in the past, is to embrace our community, because that very community that you're writing or producing content for becomes content producers themselves. So I think that's another huge factor. So when you put all of these things together, uh, Rappler's core is investigative journalism, and it's probably, there's no better time to do investigative journalism in the Philippines than now under our very interesting president. Um, uh, but you put that together with tech, what it can do, it can move you from linear growth rates to exponential growth rates, right? So for me, the difference in Rappler is um, you have a 100% growth rate year on year. Uh, when I used to manage ABS-CBN, the largest network in the Philippines, we would get a growth rate of, if you get 6 to 20%, if you get a double-digit growth rate, it's a good year. Um, for a tech company, 100% is not enough. A tech company aims for 200 to 300% growth rate. Right? So for a media company, 100% is great. Uh, so there's this exponential growth rate. What leads to that? Social media. That brings with it its own problems because you empower your community, they create content, which then the fact that they create content redefines what journalism is in your society. In the Philippines, like in Indonesia with President Jokowi, uh, last year was the first social media elections. 16 million Filipinos out of 54 million registered voters elected President Duterte, largely because of a social media campaign. So if what factors make a successful media group today? Number one is a, a continued, continued persistence with the traditional discipline of journalism. Because I think now more than ever, we need to have that because the algorithms that lead to social media are fragmenting our audiences mm -hmm. and they're making, they're creating echo chambers which traditional news groups used to break. So the first is the discipline. The second, and I'll shut up after this, is the second is a business model that works mm -hmm. because globally what you have is a slow motion disintegration of the business of the traditional news groups. That's being taken away. If you look in both our countries, 70% of the online revenues are taken up by tech companies, Google and Facebook. Where, what does that leave for online media? So the last part about Rappler's, we're purely online. We're multimedia. Mm. I came from television. This is now HD quality. I put it on a tripod and we can go live. That's amazing stuff. It's a brand new world. Uh, Maria, just very quickly on the actual media landscape of the Philippines, because I mean, you mentioned about the traditional media, and of course now there's this new media which is no longer new. In Indonesia, the basically democratization uh, manifests itself in the proliferation of uh, you know, the media, whether it's traditional, non-traditional, or new. And it's actually still occurring until now. Like I mentioned earlier, we have so many national 
the TV channels, not to mention you know, local TV channels, but how is the media being consumed in the Philippines? And what are the overriding trends? And how do you see, the, is, there, is there some kind of, uh, not only sort of friction, but perhaps the threats and challenges of the new media versus the traditional media? I think like in Indonesia, traditional media, unlike the West, for example, still has a foothold. And I would think if I were to say in the Philippines, traditional media has lost its revenue. When I was managing ABS, we used to have 90% of ad revenues went to television. And of that 90%, it went 70% went to the top television network. So you still have revenues going to TV, but all of these traditional news groups are moving online because you're seeing the compound annual growth rate really just zooming online while um, but traditional media is beginning to lose. Having said that, television is still king as it is here. So you're still seeing that, but it is, we've now moved to the stage where there are two screens minimum, if not three screens. Uh, everything comes to you. In a way, you have to start thinking of Facebook as a second, um, as a media entity because you, your news feed is what brings you the news nowadays in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Pramash, how about you? Your, uh, tell us your experience in Malaysia. Of course, I mean, we understand that when it comes to the traditional media, there's a lot more oversight from the government. I mean, certainly a lot more than what we have here in Indonesia, where we enjoy a greater freedom of expression. Now, uh, how, what is the media landscape like in Malaysia? And where do you fit in as an online news um, you know, generator that. Um, yep. The media landscape has changed quite a bit from say 10, 15 years ago. Uh, when we launched in 1999, it was very early on the internet. So obviously it was only a few internet users. But today in many ways, the internet is kind of the mainstream. Uh, more people receive their news uh, from the internet and on their mobile phones, uh, you know, than perhaps any other medium. Although television viewership is higher, they, um, uh, they view television more for entertainment than for news. Um, so, uh, the internet today is, is the mainstream, and Malaysia Kini is by far the, 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 um, the largest news provider, uh, uh, particularly because we publish in four languages, English, Malay, Chinese, and Tamil. Uh, in many multi-language uh, uh, lingual, lingual countries, I think, you know, publishing multiple uh, language is very important. I think that, uh, you know, we've seen different stages of growth from the internet days. The next bump was the uh, introducing of the smartphone, uh, and now with the price of smartphones being very low, that has become the main device. Um, I agree with, with, uh, with Maria Reza. The question now is um, you know, more a question of a business model and how do we, do we work on that. Um, looking back at our own history in terms of you know, what are uh, success factors, I think there are a few success factors. One was obviously timing. Uh, we, we started on a journey very early on and we also caught the wave of a kind of a political transition with the sacking of Anwar Ibrahim and the growth of reformasi you know, both here in Indonesia you guys managed to sack um, Suharto. We're still yeah. stuck with the same regime. Um, but yes, timing, uh, uh, I think, is very, very uh, critical. And the traditional media was generally owned by the government, so it allowed us to differentiate ourselves very important. So I think the, the capacity of media companies to differentiate themselves is very, very important. I think Rappler has done a great job in a very crowded field. They stand out, and they've been able to grow the audience very well. So uh, I think without differentiating, it's, it's actually very difficult. Um, we tried to go in the advertising route in terms of business models, but we found it very difficult in the political climate. So we tried to go subscription, getting you know, funds, uh, getting our readers to pay, and actually paid up pretty well. It sustained us uh, for a good 10 to 15 years, and we still get a lot of revenue from subscription, although now, since advertising has kicked in, it's kind of, you know, uh, uh, um, advertising now is more than, than subscription. So figuring out your business model and allowing that business model to evolve depending on the situation is also, I think, a, 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 a very critical factor. I think that, you know, I, I mean, the question is posed in terms of success of Asian media organizations. And I think it's also nice to ask the question about what, uh, what differentiates an Asian media organization in terms of challenges, as opposed to, say, someone in the US or Europe or, or other parts of the world. And I think that in Asia, we face um, a, a couple of difficulties. Firstly, is that, you know, our markets and our providers are not as sophisticated as what you get in the West. Many things from Malaysia, Kenya, I think for Apple, you've got to do it yourself. You've got to build it yourself. You've got to have a good tech team. The, the CEO downwards have got to understand technology. So if you have that depth in the organization, you're able to evolve faster as opposed to relying on vendors who tend to come to Asia, 
three to four years later, you know, than what they do in, in the US and Europe. And I think another challenge that we face is that we lose talent very fast. Our best talent either works for international companies like the CNN, um, you know, or they join politics and become, you know, politicians, or they go abroad uh, and work for big companies in the West. So how, as an Asian company, how do we manage our talent, keep our talent, uh, and grow the organizations? Because at the end of the day, media companies are talent organizations. Without the talent, we can't succeed. I think that's a major challenge that we all face. Okay, um, another thing, very much more uh, to the editorial side of it, the content side of it. I mean, for example, if Indonesia, if we did not have the first private television station back in 1990, and I, I doubt that I think we would have experienced what happened in 1998, which is actually the toppling down of an authoritarian government. So I, I do believe that having this. Uh, you know, the proliferation of television in Indonesia contributed to the, the country's journey towards democracy. In terms of the, what's happening in Malaysia, how, how do you see that? How do you uh, see that position of the journalist and the media versus the government, for example, when it comes to the push of making uh, the journey towards greater freedom of expression, greater democracy? Is, is there a you know, a significant uh, improvement that you experienced? Uh, definitely, I think that, you know, from the days where the media was totally dominated by print and broadcast, generally owned by the government to today, um, there's been huge changes. In fact, in the 2008 general elections, where the government, you know, for the first time lost their two-thirds majority, mm -hmm. uh, the then Prime Minister, uh, Abdullah Badawi, said that his biggest mistake was to underestimate the internet. Um, um, so, um, definitely, the media is pushing the boundaries but it's actually very difficult to topple an authoritarian government. Uh, um, I think, you know, you've seen changes in the Philippines and yeah. Indonesia. We wish the same would be in Malaysia, but for whatever reasons, uh, you know, partly because of our, the way, you know, religion is used as part of politics in Malaysia. There's also a lot of gerrymandering. The opposition already won 53% of the vote at the last election. The government only won 47%, uh, but still commands, you know, a, a great majority of seats. And even, they can win as low as... 35 to 40 percent, and still stay in government. So it becomes very, very difficult to displace um, um, a, a kind of a semi-authoritarian government, but even with a strong media. But do you, is there less oversight on, I mean, we hear about bloggers being arrested and so on, but is there in general less oversight on online media as opposed to, you know, the, the traditional media? And are you taking advantage of that uh, a lot of the time? Yeah, I think Malaysia Kini has been publishing very, very independently. We publish a lot about 1MDB, about corruption, you know, of all levels. Um, the stories are out there, you know, at, at numerous levels. Um, they, I, I, we, we have a very active Facebook, just like Indonesia and Twitter. So, you know, we have huge WhatsApp groups. You know, you, even you go to rural areas, um, uh, wherever there's uh, internet connectivity, even not in the house, you know, people still go to Wi-Fi to to restaurants and you know, like you know and cafes and, and access it, uh, you have um, um, uh, access to media. The only way it's lacking is in Sabah and Sarawak, which is on the you know on, on in Kalimantan in Borneo. Um, those regions are really remote. It takes three to four days to get to some of those villages. Yeah. So for them, uh, it's only television. Uh, but by and large, uh, people have access to information. Um, the other problem is also is that the opposition is also fragmented. So you know it's not just access to media, which plays a very important role, but the entire political process, elections, you know, a uh, strong alternative, only then can we see, you know, even wider change. Okay. Uh, Krishna, now, let me turn to you now as an academic with an outside perspective and also perhaps a greater understanding from the non-journalistic and the non-media point of view. We're talking about Asian media organizations. Is there a really big difference between, you know, so-called Asian media organization as opposed to, you know, the Western or Australian media organizations? And where, where do you see us performing better and what would you say our success factors are, if any, compared to uh, the other um, types of media organizations? So uh, I always think that an academic's job is to unsettle the question. So let me unsettle the question in two ways. First of all, the assumption that there is a concrete set of success factors. Um, let me unsettle it historically first. 
1972, this story may be apocryphal, but in 1972, somebody asked uh, Chuen Lai whether the French Revolution 200 years before had been successful, and he said it's too early to tell. So in some ways, whether a media organization is successful or not depends on the time frame within which you are looking at it. So that's the first unsettling. The second unsettling, I have to do this because um, this session was advertised as the great debate, and we couldn't possibly all agree with each other, then it would be a lie. So let me go to something that Maria said, which is very compelling in some ways, which is to say that you know the conventional uh, ethic, the, the conventional practices of journalism are still very, very important. Now, that statement assumes that there is a single history of journalism. That simply is not true. So, historically speaking, the Asian newspapers emerged out of a very, uh, out of actually the crucible of nationalism, if I can be dramatic about this. Um, there are a few people who probably still remember those days, Pat Makusuma, for example. Indonesia Raya was founded with a particular kind of politics in mind. It was not founded to tell two sides of the story. Because as soon as you say we have to tell two sides of the story, it sounds like we're all living in some sort of a Commonwealth British-based parliamentary yeah. democracy. Two sides? There are multiple sides to a story. And in fact, sometimes there is only one correct side to the story. And those are the stories that are the hardest to tell. Um, you know, the, the, the story of increasing inequity in the world. What's the two sides about it? The question of, um, of uh, environmental degradation. What's the two sides about it? There's only one side to tell. The question is how do you tell that in a compelling way in the context of the enormous cacophony that is the media today? And I am one of those who also doesn't believe in the line that we always draw still between the conventional media and, uh, and the social media and the internet. In fact, the news, even as something as historically important as Tempo, I only read it online, um, even something as important as the, as the New York Times, I read it online, not only that, it keeps asking me to put my favorite um, articles on my Facebook. So I'm a distributor and a reader. I could be a con content producer, distributor and reader for New York Times, not a content producer, but anyway. Um, so, you know, it's, you have to begin to unpack this question about what constitutes um, a media organization. So just quickly, uh, Daisy, you'll have to stop me when you need to stop me. I, I did warn you. <laughs> I, think, I think you raised uh, several points that we will pick up later on and then we can uh, debate it. But I, I completely, uh, you know, I think this is a very important and interesting uh, point that we need to elaborate because there's no, not one side, not two sides, not many sides. But on the other hand, we in the media organizations, we're also at different crossroads. You know, there, we, uh, Pramesh and, and Maria, we talk about, you know, the business side of it, you know, and the, there is also the, sort of the ownership side of it. And there's also the pressures from the regulators side of it. And on the other hand, we're in an increasingly fragmented society. I mean, like actually increasing fragmented world, especially here in Indonesia, very heterogeneous. You know, everybody, uh, you know, has their own opinion and that is within the social media, everybody's entitled to their one particular opinion. Actually, this does make our job as a journalist that much more challenging. But actually picking up on that, uh, Bambang, because you understand very well, and you have uh, obviously until now, very much uh, you know, the practicing journalist. How about, you know, how do you see us uh, in the, the media uh, as, as journalists, we had the idealism of you know, 1998 when we opened that freedom of the press and then we demystify a lot of you know, myth about not being able to insult you know, the government officials or presidents. And where we are at the point now where basically anything goes, I mean, how do you see Indonesia's you know, journey? Well, yeah, it's very interesting uh, for Indonesia because we move what may be the U.S. or the European country, Western European country, uh, do in a long time, over a period of a long time. Uh, we kind of 
have to do it since 98, catching up, a lot of catching up. And because of that, then you feel this giddiness of the speed of change. Uh, so for instance, uh, there are many Indonesian now uh, saying, oh, the Indonesian press is too much freedom now, kebablasan, they said, yeah? But actually, if you look at a more objective global benchmarking of Indonesian press freedom, we are not even categorized as free. We are still partly free. Yeah? So uh, th there is this, this context of how some people who maybe used to live up under the new order for many years where everything is polite, everything is, you know, you shouldn't rock the boat, it has to be harmonious and so on, and then suddenly everybody can say whatever they want. This is, of course, something that, and especially if what is stated is what we call inconvenient truth. Nobody, nobody like inconvenient truths. But now with social media, anyone can just, not only inconvenient truth, but inconvenient lies also. You know, yeah. So now I think uh, the, the, the role of journalism in Indonesia has shifted the traditional role from the gatherer of information and distributor of information and now becoming more like the fact checker of all this information. The, the one who find the, the, the right information out of all these garbages. It's different, it's more editorial works than of reporter works actually. And like, but it's actually already happening in the, in, the, in the countries with freedom of expression. But Indonesians are still in the flow of doing that. And that's also, uh, can be seen on the market side because s since nine years ago, I'm no longer a chief editor, but more using my other head as a CEO. So I have to think about the business side, about the market. And you can see uh, here is, it's very easy to get information from the digital world. But the advertiser would still pay a premium in a digital work that has a physical side of it if you have the printing side of it, somehow, somehow the, the market here think you are more credible. It's not always necessarily true, but that is the association. If you are digital only, because then the assumption is anybody can make digital. So then you are graded as less accurate, which is not true. I mean, Malaysia Kini is much more accurate than most of the printing press in Malaysia. But, uh, you know, but Ma Ma Malaysia in this case is uh, an outlier, the exception, not the rule. But anywhere, and I think this is actually the business model problem of, of the media now, is because everybody knows we have to go into full digital, but the revenue stream for uh, digital is still not solid for a very simple reason, you said yeah. before we only have five TVs to divide all the market. No, everybody can have a TV station but through we the internet. don't know how to monetize it. You know, no, that's no, no, no. It's, it's, it's not that because the market is because the digital. market is divided into so many. Instead of mm -hmm. only five stations, now you have I don't know thousand, thousand. Oh, yeah. And also the problem with the, the digital is if I have a internet TV if suddenly so many people watch my TV, it will collapse, you know? Not like broadcast, no, no matter how many turn on their TV, it will remain the same. But now, if suddenly millions of people watch a video in Malaysia Kini, mm -hmm. it will collapse. Just very quickly, Bama, uh, because there's a saying, you know, the newspaper will kill, um, the online will kill the a newspaper. Tempo being, you know, the, the, the print yeah. media, and you also have a tempo.com and so on. How, how, is, how is each of that doing? Where is actually the real cash cow still coming from? Yeah. Well, I think this is the thing. For, uh, for print media, the worst is if you are newspaper, and newspaper that use the American model, where basically you lose money from your circulation. So you basically live out of advertisement only. Yeah? Um, because then when the advertisement revenue going down, then you are basically in big problem. But if your newspaper business model is 
like the Japan, Japan or Germany or France, where they still earn money from the print, from the circulation side, you are more okay. Uh, but the problem in Indonesia is newspapers follow the American model, so uh, that's uh, the problem. But on the other hand, if you can move from too much uh, uh, depending on advertising revenue into reader revenue, then actually you are okay. Because uh, the more reader you have, then the more uh, money you have. But the problem is people in the internet so used to have free stuff. Mm -hmm. So for them to convert them into payment is not easy. And the second is to pay in small amount, the infrastructure is still not de yet there. So we have to wait until you can pay few cents for an article. Then I think it actually will become liberating for journalists. Because as a journalist, I prefer to live from my reader than from advertisers. I would feel that they appreciate more. You know, I, I prefer to have 10 million readers, uh, no advertiser, than let's say got you know the same amount of money but no readers, because that's not uh, what we live for. So in a sense, the digital world give you a golden opportunity for journalists to be liberated from from advertisement uh, hostage, but. Uh, it's very competitive, which is good. And the thing, the other thing is, what about investigative journalism? Because can you live from one story? Because I have a friend in New York Times. In one year, he, or, he already produced two stories in one year. Uh, but can two stories pays for all this investigative? And he was doing investigative outside America. He was doing an investigative in in Mexico, which is a very important story, but who's going to pay? He's lucky, but New York Times will pay for, for him. But if there is an uh, institution like New York Times, Wall Street Journal, or Guardian, is no longer exist, how can we organize ourselves to do this important, expensive, time-consuming, uh, and take a lot of mm -hmm. energy stories? How? Who? Who will finance this? Okay. This is the question. I think the, uh, my next question is, I think uh, everybody, uh, if they can answer this. Bambang said earlier that, you know, the traditional media, people still look for us for credibility. Yeah. There is, you know, we have, st we have our ethics, we have our code of conduct and so on and so forth. But in reality, a, a lot of the time, people actually look for non-traditional media for the truth, so to speak. They don't have that trust that they're used to when it comes to the traditional media. And there's that, uh, that problem, you know. If you want to know what's really going on, you look at somebody's blogs, you go on uh, online. You don't necessarily go on the traditional media. The other thing is the idea of the business side, which links very much with ownership. And we see, particularly in Indonesia, the reason why we have such a proliferation of the media is because the people know the influence that the media can give them, in which case there's a lot of motivation to own media to basically buy influence, which leads to all sorts of moral hazards. And we've seen it in the last general, uh, presidential election, where ownerships really basically polarize the, the two camps, depending on which, uh, who's supporting what. And the third thing is, especially if we're looking now, not just in the Asian media context, but it's, it's around the world, particularly uh, with the US election coming up. It's the fragmentation, it's the polarization, it's the, the belligerence and, I mean, of the society, you know, with, where we're trapped in identity politics, we're trapped in, you know, religious politics, we're trapped in all sorts of things that we would have never really seen before the advent of technology. Very quickly, perhaps, Maria, I mean, how, how do you see how the journalists role as the watchdog, as the standard bearer, as the one that would, should keep things you know, morally bound and politically correct in a world which is increasingly adopting political incorrectness and at the same time we are dependent on rating and sensationalism. 
wow, there is so much in there. Can I, I'll first connect the first three things you said and then end with the journalist role. I think the technology, as it's led to exponential growth and disruption in every industry, in society, in the way we communicate, communication is at the core of that explosion, that exponential growth. It's the digitization of information, right? That's what's made it everything grow. So what does that mean? When you have an Uber disrupting a hotel, uh, sorry, a, a taxi company, when you have an Airbnb disrupting a hotel, these companies, that's only the facade, the tip of the iceberg of what you see. Uh, in terms of what does it do to society, the change on top plays out in, in information. And what's happened is the reason why they distrust traditional media in some of our societies Malaysia included, I think, is, is because our media has been owned by corporation, corporate entities, vested interests. And so at the beginning, and I think this would be maybe five years ago in the Philippines, people would say, well, I know who they're going to support. I know who they're going to support. You saw this in, in 2014 during the elections. They have vested interests, so I don't really believe what, they, what they're going to say. That greater empowerment for the rest of the people, for, for the minority, if you call it now, has spurred this crowd, the crowd, the wisdom of the crowds, and they've created blogs. I mean, even in Iraq, I remember going to a blogger uh, at, at the beginning of the Iraq war to find out what was going on. Okay, so empowerment. So first is it, it shows vested interests of traditional media. Second is greater empowerment for everyone. Now I think it's the third phase, which is, when you have all these different opposing views often coming together, where does the truth lie? Um, and when that happens, and I'll bring it to the Philippines, it opens a Pandora's box, and the Pandora's box of anger. So my, the connection is with technology and anger, displacement of people, displacement of identity, uh, the ability to be able to scream now in a public space for people who have never had the public spotlight. And I think that anger now leads to a change in the democratic space. That's part of the reason President Duterte was elected in the Philippines. I think it's part of the reason you have the rise of Trump in the United States. You're seeing it all connect. Where does this bring the journalists? And I'll, I'll end with this one. It brings the journalists back to a place where, for me, it is about the discipline of trying to stop, to, trying to find a more complex, comprehensive view of the world that is inclusive of all these opposing perspectives. Trying to not be corrupt. Those ethics, the standards of ethics, and, and I am trained in the West, so perhaps there's part of that there. So it goes back, I think now we go back to what is truth in this age, what is, what is our role as journalists as we redefine it, um, and we will be pressed on many sides, top down by governments who want to silence us, and bottom up by people who want to change us to reflect their echo chambers, because that's, and that leads us to the last part of the algorithms of the platform where they consume the news. Those algorithms do not differentiate between fact and fiction. If you're a political propaganda page, you have just as much and sometimes more power to be trending in Facebook. I mean, you saw this two weeks ago with Hillary Clinton. A, a, a lie that was about her was trending number one on Facebook for more than 24 hours. But the, just very quickly, with somebody like the president, Duterte, with you know, more than 90% you know, popularity, but, how, where does the journalist stand? Because whose voice are we if, you know, when somebody with the, that kind of uh, personality and also policy is extremely popular? Because then this puts the journalist in a very difficult position, right? Absolutely, and you have to go to back to what the core of journalism is, which is the courage to speak truth to power. Right now, there are three simultaneous live streams. Yesterday, our, the Philippine Senate ousted the woman who was uh, the heading the Commission on Human Rights that investigated Duterte's Davao death squad or the Davao death squads that were linked to President Duterte. Um, this is now ongoing. There's a House of Representatives hearing. What, what do we do as journalists? We speak truth to power, and we will get 
clobbered in the interim period by a government that will be displeased and by a public that is so increasingly polarized. And I think our challenge is going to be to try to find that space where we can help shape the truth together. Mm -hmm. Tremash, your thoughts? I mean, lots of things, especially in you know, Malaysia with this corruption yeah. issue of the prime minister and yeah. everything. I, I mean, you can speak about Malaysia as well as, you know, what does it say globally, right? We've seen so much of the rise of the outsider in politics, whether it's in the US, in the Philippines, and elsewhere. Um, I, I think that you look at media and look at politics, they're both based on a very similar concept. It's about trust. Do you trust the media? Do you trust your politician? Um, it, it, it can be format-driven, like you have a magazine, then you seem to be more trustworthy. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a kind of an emotional relationship. Uh, and, and, you know, you think about before there was social media, you had a political structure which was pretty dependent on the media to, to get by in, in many ways, right? Uh, um, Without um, a supportive media, it was very hard to get elected. Um, but today, with social media, there is kind of like a direct access from the politician to the, to the electoral. And the electoral, through social media, kinds of form their own echo chamber. So you can, you know, ignore the facts. Like uh, we're talking about a, you know, a society which kind of, you know, ignores the facts, right? But your own factual, your own world is created through your social media environment what you're reading on your Facebook, on your WhatsApp, et cetera, right? And, and um, so in the case of the Philippines, you know, uh, or in the U.S., you can just kind of ignore what's going on and just support a particular leader. And, and similarly, it's happening in Malaysia. If you, if you bring back home, you've got obviously the, you know, so much of evidence against an utterly corrupt uh, a politician. Uh, you know, U.S. billions of dollars. You know, you can, you can count how much money is in account as a percentage of the, of the GDP. I think, you know, Malaysia likes to be the best in the world. <laughs> and again, we're kind of like, you know, it's, it's such a huge scandal. Yet, you know, people form their own groups and, you know, uh, kind of ignore the obvious and, and continue to go along. Um, so if you ask that kind of question in terms of, okay, given this, what's the role of the journalist, right? The fact is that the, the playing field of the journalist has shrunk enormously. Uh, it has shrunk enormously because... Uh, the readers don't need the media anymore, don't need the journalists anymore. They, have, they get the media from all, from all you know, other places. It's also shrunk because of we don't have the same finance. We don't command the same financial model that we used to. So the question is really about what does journalism do in this shrunken playing field, you know, both you know, in, the, in the fear of their influence and this kind of financial model. And that's a big question. And I think that it, it'll take a lot of innovation, uh, a lot of, you know, thinking out of the box to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, we will always stay relevant, but I suppose the relative relevance, our relative relevance has shrunk a lot, and that's what we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, of course, the pull of having to get the eyeballs, which means that you do end up compromising some of the journalistic standards to more sensationalist stories, for example. Now, how do you navigate that, given the fact that you are, you know, as an, uh, especially in an online media, very much dependent on the, the eyeballs, the kind of the traffic that you get. And unfortunately, you know, the way the world works, you know, sometimes the rating and, co and good quality journalism does not go hand in hand. Definitely. Readers have, have turned into uh, voyeurs. They want to know what happened today, who said what, you know, the biggest scandal of the day. You know, they want to know what was, you know, who's making a deal with who. It's kind of very voyeuristic. They don't want to read a long article and understand what's going on, you know. Those articles get the least views, um, you know. Um, so it's actually very, very difficult. And yes, we have to balance between uh, reporting the day's news and doing more investigative pieces. Uh, unfortunately, today, given our financial resources, we end up doing a lot of, you know, what's the news today. Uh, and I would love to do much more investigative reporting. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's a tough, um, you know, and also the journalist today spends less time uh, in that journalism career. I think the average person spends three to four years in Malaysia Kini uh, and then goes off and does public relations or goes off and works for Yahoo or MSN or some <laughs> other big company or goes off and you know, does the master's degree yeah. and PhD and becomes an academic. Um, journalism doesn't pay what it used to. Uh, and that's very, very un unfortunate. So yes, there is a, we, we find it hard to struggle in this sort of situation. 
Mm -hmm. I think it's a never-ending struggle just simply because, you know, who we are and our position. Uh, Krishna, how, how do you see the, the role of the journalist? Are we doing, you know, uh, our... Are we doing a good job? And also, if we compare, for example, what's happening in the US at the moment, where because one of the candidates basically... Uh, everything that comes out of his mouth becomes, you know, newsworthy maybe for all the wrong reasons, and yet the media picks it up and uh, because it's good for the rating and so on. How, how do you see us performing here in Asia? And so, I don't want to give you an elephant stamp or anything like <laughs> that, um, but I don't think the academic and the journalist are actually that far apart. Um, it's quite interesting that as information has become more democratically available, we have seen the uh, arise of non-specialists who can have a huge voice in the media. So our job has become less about finding the facts and reporting the facts and more about not so much telling the truth to power, but more about translating and interpreting, translating in the sense of taking specialist knowledge and making it consumable. So in a sense, the journalism that produces the president in uh, Philippines may well become the thing, God forbid, um, produce the president in, uh, in the United States. Because what we expect journalists to do is to report facts, which means you have to report noise. You have to report whoever is making the most noise. You have to report that which is already attracting uh, attention. What that means is you're just, journalism is simply multiplying the cacophony. It is not finding a way out of uh, that uh, mess into some kind of consumable, bite-sized pieces of information, data, fact, but also truth that the population needs to hear. Uh, and th this makes journalism really important. It means journalism has to get really clever because, of course, we know that uh, Generation X, Generation Y, whatever generation they are these days, the post-internet generation has extremely short, extremely brief um, kind of... Uh, concentration span. Yeah, but I think also there's an increasing gap in what we think is good journalism and what actually our cons media consumers really want, which this is why, you know, sometimes, you know, these things, we don't really speak to one another on this level. But on the other hand, but because we are so dependent on... Uh, you know, the business aspect of it, which is at the end of the day, rating and so on and so forth, we're much more, it's easier for us now to be played, so to speak. And, and we can see it every day, how we in the media are being manipulated, but also we fall into that trap of the he says, she says, and that becomes basically the, you know, the bread and butter of our journalism. And if that, the one who says something that creates more rating or more viewership, then automatically, you know, it's as if we are endorsing a particular point of so view. So to me, this is partly the problem, uh, and let me be an academic and a teacher for a minute, this is partly the way in which we are reproducing a kind of journalistic training which says a journalist must cover all sides of the truth. A journalist must report rather than interpret. So I think Bambang's point was a good one. Journalism needs to move from reporting to editorializing and be proud of it. Journalism needs to move from telling the balanced set of facts to saying this is the truth you need to understand, to being a teacher, to being pedagogic. You need to move to be quite honest, to being advocacy for the progressive thinking. And in community, community newspapers, community radio, where you are not doing it for the money, you're not doing it as a profession, but doing it for a passion, it is much easier. So one of the things, we've, I'm gonna stop at this point in a minute. Um, uh, one of the things I've tried to do in my own university is to collapse the journalism course into something called strategic communication. Because we are going to need communicators who are strategically able to promote progressive 
capacities. The NGOs, the environmental groups, the feminist groups, they are all going to need to be able to speak truth to power. Mm -hmm. Bambang, would you like to, I mean, the very idealistic in a way, I mean, investigative reporting is very costly, you know, it's, it's, but uh, Bambang, uh, uh, your comments, and also perhaps because in Indonesia, media and politics, we're just so closely bound together. And that's, you know, it has its pitfalls as well, especially when we get trapped into taking sides and also playing politics because of ownership problems as well. Yeah, I think it's, that's, uh, you know, Krishna is actually uh, fortunate in Australia, even though the private media is owned by maybe a few families, but at least they got a good public uh, journalism, like ABC and uh, SBS, which, and uh, SBS is a special case because SBS is only cater for the uh, ethnic multipluralism. Yeah? And uh, so uh, that is posed a question that even I'm surprised that even my American friend who usually was very much again anything called public, now are talking quite openly that if good journalism is a public good, then shouldn't be it be financed by public fund. Yeah. And which is actually already happening in Scandinavian countries and so on. And uh, but unfortunately in Indonesia, we, we have this problem. We don't have good public uh, media. Uh, and one of the good public media is like BBC. And if you look at how BBC handle the situation now, they not only have the traditional news, but they have also have something what they call explainer, yeah? which trying to put into context, trying to put you know, uh, things into a deeper thought. Because the problem with the internet is we are all become shallower. I mean, since internet, I read much less book than I used to be. Yeah? And especially the kids now, if they read something more than 144 words, they, go, they lost interest. So there is this trend that's not necessarily good for our future. And I think uh, the role of journalism now is to say, even though this is not popular, we have to do it. It's just like inconvenient truth. It's not nice to say, to, to, to write inconvenient truth, because you know, even your mother and mother-in-law might, might don't like you because you said this inconvenient truth. But without somebody saying the inconvenient truth, we might not survive as a, you know, in our uh, society to become more progressive society. We, we might go back to barbarian. So this is, I think it's even more uh, important and I think it's actually you know, he was complaining about journalism maybe getting less paid than it used to be. But to me, maybe it's also, there is a bright side into it because journalism used to be for people who believe in doing something good for the society. And when the industry of TV make all these journalists very rich, you attract the different kind of people to be a, a, a journalist. In fact, in Australia, for instance, this jockey, what you call it, radio jockey. They are not journalists, but they are quite rich. They are shock jocks, yeah? <laughs> but they are not actually journalists in a sense because we always know in, in media, there is always two components. One is who work as entertainer, and the other one is who work as you know, journalism for public goods. And, and during the heyday of private TV in the 70s, it was actually the, the journalists on the entertainment side who get all the, the money. It's because you look good, because people like to see you, because they like to listen to your voice, not because they like what the news this person is, is giving. So, but now, the same thing happened in the internet journalism. You know, very high hit for sensationalist uh, statement. But actually, you have to look deeper into that. I always say my young journalists, especially on online, who are sometimes succumb to this temptation, if you make the, the title like this, and then you get a lot of hit. I said, but this is a bait, yeah. what I call clickbait. is actually yeah. what I call a meteoric hit. It seemed like going up, but it then gone. But look at all the good articles. A year later, 
most probably it's most read because what we call a good article have a long line yeah long tail you know this this uh, entertaining is very short tail maybe this day today it will become the most hit but by tomorrow almost no one read it but if you have a good article maybe today mm -hmm. one third of that read you but after a month maybe higher hit so if you look at the hit rate for instance of bbc it's still the highest if you even you look at wikipedia uh, wikipedia in indonesia is still higher than most of, uh, of the media so you know don't don't get uh, tempted by this short term hit and I think what I like is that now even the advertiser already realize mm -hmm. what they call a fake hit or, you know, just a meteoric hit and the more permanent hit. Of course, they want to put their ad more in the long tail hit than in the, you know, short term hit, you know. Uh, so I believe even when all this settle down, uh, journalism will survive. But the problem is, we have to survive when, how long these Wall Street people have money to burn. Because right now, a lot of digital thing is just money being burned because they want to get the market share. And only when they got the market share, then they will start behaving like normal business. How long will this stay on? So for me in Tempo is, how we survive this period until the Wall Street people burn all their money. <laughs> if we can survive that, then we're okay. <laughs> okay. And of course, what's happening here in Indonesia, we're still in the process of digitalization, and you know, there's, there's a lot of teething problems, and, and, and I think uh, the analog mentality is still there. But we are seeing it already. We are seeing a fragmentation of you know, society, viewership, consumers. So I think this is something yeah. that we all have to accept in the future. And also, you know, at the end of the day... But, but, but let, me, let me give you an example. Okay. During the last election, you know, we always proudly say we are actually not neutral. We are taking the right side, right? But what happened in the election is almost 50-50. Yeah. Which right. side is the right side? That's what we had in the last election because between Jokowi and Prabowo is 53% to 47%. So which is the public right side? So which side? <laughs> yeah. well, well, to me it's very clear, but well, as not, journalistically speaking, yes, not, it's not, uncomfortable. Not if you speak to the other side and they, they come up with a different argument. Let's, um, let's have some questions from the floor, please. Yes. Could you please identify yourself and um, who would you like to answer the question? And you know, we have, would you like maybe, for those who want to um, ask questions, would you line up behind a microphone? It will be easier. Uh, I think we seem to only have one fixed microphone. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, and thank you for your nice moderation. Uh, basically, I have a question. I, I have no idea who will answer this. Sorry, uh, could you just identify yourself for us? So yeah, we know where my you. name is A.S.M. Buzlur Rahman. I am working with uh, Bangladesh NGOs Network for Radio and Communication. We are promoting community media with the support from Preparation Limited. Mm -hmm. My question is uh, just overview. The most of the media machine, uh, it is uh, electronics or print media, are now highly monopolized or controlled by economic power. You have already discussed in here. Uh, we see across the Asia and Pacific region. Uh, and uh, people say uh, most of the highly corrupted corporate sector owned by media machine. Uh, sometime they said uh, they hijacked by the media machine. Okay, as a result, same house owned by radio, television, daily newspaper, English or, bang, bang, English or uh, online, like this. So in this regard, this significantly biases content towards profit generation and reduce diversity of sources and content. As a result, it's directly hampered to gender equality also. So in this situation, how we say success factor of Asian media? Thank you. Okay, well, let's give everybody a chance to answer. 
a, a quick yeah. answer. Maria. Yeah, I, I mean, I can give you. I used to work for a tycoon in the Philippines after I left CNN, and then I realized that technology is extremely empowering. I now am the majority shareholder in Rappler. You actually can, with, uh, with the new technology, shift it away from traditional, from corporate media. A corporation, and, and again, I'll give you some numbers. Uh, when I headed the largest news group, you can spend, um, let's say you spend uh, uh, 2 million US on CapEx, right? Uh, now that exact same thing, using the digital equipment that you have, uh, you can spend, we started Rappler with 150,000 people and we sometimes beat the large corporate media. 150,000 US in CapEx and 12 people. Uh, so it is very possible, and this is both the challenge and the opportunity this Chinese saying, you know, and, uh, it is a challenge and the opportunity. You can do a lot more for less. Uh, it is an empowering technology, not just for the society, but for journalists ourselves to actually create and own and define what journalism will become in the future. And I think building communities, what you talked about, community media, starting there, building communities of action is, is our goal. Yeah, I think that's a challenge, being a commercial media. Perhaps very much would you like to add to that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, big, big companies, uh, I like to call them pandas. They're huge, they're big, they're bold. You see them, you know, walk around very obviously. Um, but they have got a lot of handicaps. They can't really, they're not as nimble as smaller companies. Um, and like Maria Teresa said, I think there's a lot of opportunity out there where they're slow to adopt. They're very, very slow to move into internet. They're slow to use social media. They're very slow. So I think that if you concentrate on your audience and what they want, and you build a trust relationship, um, the audience has much more faith in a small organization that they know, and they, can, they put a face to, than a huge corporation. So um, we can't beat them in terms of resources, but we can beat them in other ways. Anybody else want to add? Um, just to say, everything I know about community media, I've been taught by Anton. So, Anton is probably the best person to answer this question. Yeah, no, no, I think what the digital does to the media industry is uh, almost the same thing what happened to the airline industry when they moved from regular airline to budget. Uh, low budget uh, airlines. Yeah? So, I think what Maria Ressa is trying to do is exactly like that because nobody in the right mind would think about how to beat Pan America or TWA before, you know. But it's been a very expensive run company and so on. It has certain expensive cultures. So when you want to make into a budget airline, you need to change the paradigm. So, mm -hmm. And it's not easy to change this kind of paradigm. That's, that's why a, a startup has a better mm -hmm. chance to do that. I think that, that's what happened in the uh, media now. And I think uh, I know that some of the owner of uh, big TV in Indonesia now is very worried about mm -hmm. this, how to adapt, because they know that now it's not the strongest, biggest, largest company that will survive, but the one that is the most adaptable. Uh, in fact, in the digital world now, they say they don't want to become a unicorn anymore because a unicorn is a myth. They want to become more like a cockroach because cockroach <laughs> is real and survive. You know, so so you have to to re remember that. So I think the, the the key is if you have the passion like Marisa has, she could do a lot with much less money than any uh, uh, big company, and she will uh, she will uh, survive and better because that's her passion. So and I think if you look at the young people now. They are also very passion driven. They no longer think I have to think about 20 years from now, will I have enough for my retirement and so on and so on. Yeah. You know. And also as the technology gets cheaper as well, I think that... Uh, Sorry, was... can I add something okay. at this point? Um, <laughs> you thought of something. Okay. I've just thought of something that really comes out of what Bambang just said. Um, I, I, I really think that passion and content is going to be the ingredient of journalism. I know you said I was being impractical, but I, I, if you think of the great institutional movements uh, throughout the history of the world, 
they have come from things where somebody has been driven by passion, including Facebook. Yeah. Mad passion. Absolutely. Um, although now Facebook is running everything. You know, that's, that's the other. Uh, but it's true, content is king, although we also have a saying, you know, rating is queen. So, you know, it, it just depends. Yes. Next, please. Hello. My name is Kemal Win. I'm from DVB, Democratic Vice Obama. We used to be based in Norway previously for 20 years. Coming back to the country, the last four years, uh, two of panelists know us very well. Ben Ben used to be our board member, and I'm playing now our business consultant. We are looking for the, the right business model to begin a success media house in the country. But in fact, many independent media in the country, mainly private dailies, have failed even before coming up to the surface. Last three years, the government issued 32 licenses for the private dailies. About half of them started printing, and only five remains in the market. But they are standing on the margin. Why? They cannot compete government dailies, which has 400,000 copies a day. The private dailies only maybe one-tenth of the government dailies. So they can attract commercial advertisers, they are dying, they are key in the market. Now, television. Uh, Mario Rasa also mentioned that the television commercial is the largest in the media commercial in any given country. The same in our country. We are in the television sector. Now, and then you also mentioned that digitalization. This is the problem in our region. We are transforming from analog TV to digital TV. But I don't know, this is the question I want to ask all of you. But I just, we just learned something from Thailand. I believe they are doing much better than in our case. Um, analog audience is 10 times higher than digital audience in most countries, at least in our country. So when the government issue new license for new cameras, it is for digital TV, for lesser audience. So what we learned from Thailand is that the governing body, what they call it, National Television and Communication Commission, NBTC, they make it, the two audiences become close to each other so that new camera will be able to compete in the market. But in our case, not yet. And the analog audience is about 40 million. Digital audience is about 3 million. Mm -hmm. So there will be four, five new cameras who will get a license to block us in the coming months. Okay. So there is a danger. Just look at what happened in the print media. But the broadcast media, there will be another killing fee. So the government is intentionally doing it, we suspect. So what I want to ask is that any of your country, the governing body overseeing this, you know, the digitalization mm -hmm. video can make sure the market is fair and so the newcomer can compete. OK. Anybody wants to respond? Because I, I yeah, yeah. in Indonesia, we are still in that well, process of well, yeah, I have to, migrating. I have to make a caveat here. I have to make a declaration first. I know DVB very well because I was the, on the board of DVB until a few years ago. And it was really a funny experience because while I was still as on the board of DVB, I was asked by the UN to become an international media advisor for the government of Myanmar under the military junta. So I have one like on DVB, uh, on the exile community, and one like on the government. And it's just, uh, but, but having that experience, uh, I believe, you know, like DVB, I wouldn't recommend DVB to become fully private media. I think DVB was designed something, Myanmar, I think in this sense, uh, should follow the Australian model where you have ABC, the mainstream uh, uh, public media, but you also have SBS, because, because Burma has a lot of these ethnic minorities that need a special, a special you know, attention media. Because if you leave it to the private media, they will be not interested in covering the, the minorities. While the minorities, actually the reason why you have so many of this rebellion, because the minorities feel their voice is not heard. So the, I think it's a state duty to make sure that all the minorities' voice 
is heard and they and then and they can have ex, express whatever they want. So, uh, if I talk to your government now, I would prefer that the VB would become like SBS and turn the other Burma, uh, national TV to become like uh, ABC. And uh, of course we need a, a private sector, leave the private sector to the private, because I also know that people who are interested in DVB, most of the journalists in DVB, they, their heart, their passion is in public journalism, not, you know, not entertainment or, 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 or something like that. So I hope the, uh, Madam Aung San Suu Kyi would, would really, because she loved BBC, but I would prefer more the ABC SBS model than the BBC model. The SBS um, model is not actually um, only information. There is a huge element of entertainment, no entertainment, because, because of the fracturing of the community into ethnically specific entertainment group. So uh, the, the, the main kind of content of SBS is actually entertainment programs from outside of Australia. So a number of European languages, we see Indonesian movies on SBS, I see Hindi movies on SBS. So the, the line between entertainment and information and expression of identity is also being eroded to some extent. But not Uh, well, anybody else want nobody to? who has the commercial interest would produce an SBS type of program. Um, probably not necessarily true because um, because SBS actually is now getting quite a lot of advertising. Okay, Pramash, you want to add yeah. something? Yeah, I think in any kind of market opening, you ha you're going to have this curve, right, where you have an oversupply of content and digital channels and newspapers, and then you have a settling down. I think the question from DVB is that you know there are going to be so many channels. How does DVB carve a niche for itself? Is it like following a, you know, an SBS model, catering for a wider, you know, not just Yangon-based community, you know, or, or what's its model? Is it a combination of public service plus entertainment? Um, what we know is that DVB is a, is a favorite brand. Everybody loves DVB because of its role in creating the democratic change. So how do you harness that and develop a very strong position in a very competitive market? To me, that, that is the question. Do you want to have something to add? Or? So we have uh, more questions from the floor, please. Uh, <laughs> My question is, in the digital transformation, every ASEAN country is going through transformation from analog to digital TV. Okay? The audience size is really different between the two. So the governing body in charge of you know, this market have important role to make sure market conditions fair so that new cameras will not be killed in the market. They can compete fairly. So any of your governing body in your country is doing something similar to the governing body in yeah. Thailand. Okay, well, uh, let me just yeah. say something, because this is very interesting, because here in Indonesia, this is very much uh, one of the reasons why we've been very slow at migrating to the digital platform. It's because the owners of analogs, they have invested so much and for so long, and they're not willing to relinquish uh, their analog, uh, their, their coverage. And also, it would very much change the business model, because the analog business model is, of course, very different to the uh, digital. So what we've seen at the moment is because of the pr so many national channels so what we have is actually the conglomeration of ownership, but they're all the on, still on very much an analog problem, and they have a very strong lobby with the government. And uh, as a matter of fact, Indonesia is still very much trying to find what is, what is the best way of doing it. And to be honest, here in Indonesia, analog is still very much the way uh, for the audience to consume the media. The digital platform is still very much because you have to basically, you know, upgrade your uh, television and you have to, you know, different, do different things which will, again, may not be in the interest of the investors or the owners. Well, that was always the claim of the big analog industry. But actually, almost no f big TV factory produce analog TV soon. Yeah. So it's just... You know, it's not defensible, uh, and and I, I think I, I agree. And the difference in digital system than in broadcast is, you have to differentiate between the broadcaster and the content producer, 
And I think the, the broadcaster system in this system should be actually done not by private or not by uh, government, but by independent uh, bodies, by infrastructure. So in, the, in England, it's run by BBC, but in, uh, in some other countries, it's usually run by the telecom uh, uh, company that has no interest on the, on the uh, they are natural, content natural. So then the content provider could focus only on, uh, and that will uh, lessen the prices of, of uh, the content uh, producer. So what you need is an independent commission uh, who really understand about this system uh, to be established. Because before the new government came into being, it was still you know, done by uh, the government. And I think that is the problem. So you need, uh, in Australia, what you call it? The, there is this independent... Uh, Broadcast Commission. Uh, bodies yeah. to, to deal with this. So they are uh, usually people who are understanding in journalism and understanding in the antitrust mm -hmm. uh, business, independent people for a certain period of time who decide on this. Yeah. Of course, the, the, the secretariat, the bureaucrat can be government people, but the decision maker should be done by independent uh, and yeah. professional people. Well, here in Indonesia, we, it's under the Ministry of uh, Communication and Information, but unfortunately, you know, the the uh, investors, the television, the, the, the owners, they're very yeah. powerful No, because uh, I, I, I think in well. Indonesia, the problem is the independent commission mm -hmm. is not uh, given enough power to, to decide on this. And, uh, yeah. and that, and I think the lobby of the big TV yeah. is still too businesses. strong. Okay. So, well, the problem in Myanmar is the government in Indonesia is the cartel <laughs> of the... Uh, the conglomerates, yeah, the, yes. the broadcast industry Just, uh, owners. Okay. So quickly in that, I was involved peripherally in the Philippines when it switched from analog to di digital. And I think the first thing was all of the media groups were involved in that in some way, and we all decided, and the commission had to decide which type of digital it was going to be, Japanese or different, the different forms that they had, European versus Japan. I will push you to move beyond that because the technology exists today that makes this discussion irrelevant. Um, you can actually get a larger market just by taking your cell phone, which is HD quality, and broadcasting on a strong broadband on Facebook. Mm -hmm. There are companies that have made that a business model. Yeah. It is there. So I'm not sure what you want or what niche market, whether you go niche or whether you go mass. Either way, you have both in digital. Okay, um, I know we're running out of time, but we did start late, so I will allow one more question. Yes, sir. Yes, it's uh, good to have so much intellect in this panel. Uh, my question would be, if your conclusion is that in one way or another there's a need for, uh, let's say, a public scrutiny or public access to information and public service media, it seems to me that in one way or another you will need regulatory agencies or regulatory commissions that somehow serve the public rather than the commercial interest or the government interest what kind of strategies, because you are all in one way or another sprung up as you know, independent initiatives, what kind of collective or political or regional or national uh, advocacy would be needed and how could that take shape? Because I think many countries are left behind in Asia, uh, so I think it's an important issue. Okay. Anybody? Well, I think my idea is that the public media should be financed by uh, the tax from the advertisement to the private media. And the reason is to keep the balance. So when the private media is doing well, there will be more fun for the public media. While the private media is not doing too well, so it's also you know some budget cut in it, just to keep uh, the balance. And uh, because you don't want you want also room for private media to, to be there. You want to keep uh, the balance. And the other thing is, I sometimes also thinking along the Mar Marisa way of thinking that this DT2 maybe also already become obsolete. Maybe it should be taken, uh, given to, so everybody 
have broadband. My only problem with that is I think we need another disruptive technology on the internet because the problem with internet TV is the moment there are big hit, you collapse. Yeah, yeah, and and it's a, it's problematic. For instance, I'm I'm running a internet TV. We have to decide how big is our bandwidth because if you hire too wide and then only very few people see your movies, then you lost money. If you too low and then suddenly there are a lot of people interested, in it, then you collapse. So you need a little bit more this uh, technology advance to make this flag more flexible. And the other thing is micropayment. It, it, the, the cost transaction of, of, of is still for micropayment is still too high. In Indonesia, is way too high, 5,000 rupiah per transaction. Maybe you can go down if you're big to 3,000 rupiah. That means if your co you want to charge only uh, 500 rupiah, it's impossible. But if you could do that, if there is a new technology where you could charge for each article 500 rupiah, people can just click away and something like that, then I think it will really a second win for good journalism because then journalism will be liberated from the pressure of advertisers and, you know, and then they be really become uh, what I call is bertanggung uh, jawab or responsible for the accountable readers, host. accountable. And I think that how I'm looking forward for that day. To me, it would be very liberating for mm -hmm. me as a journalist. Thank Maria, you. you're dying to add something. No, I was just going to say you, um, Amazon has a service. We can talk about it, which, which is flexible. Yes, but, but, but. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to add on that respect? I, I just want to say about the, you know, some kind of body, supervision body, and for the broadcast industry, we have this independent broadcast commission. But on, on the other hand, you know, the, the judgment is also being you know, questioned because um, at the end of the day, you know, who are the people behind it and who do they represent? And sometimes, you know, they, the, the role is more sort of not so much to protect, but it has an effect in limiting the freedom of expression and also uh, kind of undermining the audience maturity, for example, by issuing certain rules and regulations that are actually not in keeping with the spirit of the day. But it's, it's, you know, it brings us back to that I, days of paternalism where this is suitable for viewership, this is not suitable, but then who are we? to say that this is suitable or not suitable because... I, I think there is a solution to that. The problem is because our KPI have to be selected by our parliament. They should be selected directly or by the professionals. See, this, is, this is one of the problems. Uh, Krishna? And this is just a footnote to Bambang because uh, he's been talking about the ABC. And the ABC works very well as a model for public broadcasting. It is funded by a one-line budget from the general revenues of the Australian government. And it is, it is ruled by a board which by its constitution is completely independent of the government. And that works as a model for, uh, for public broadcasting. A quick response to the idea of the TVB. Now, whether or TV, not TVB can succeed as an internet-only organization depends on the extent of penetration. And in many parts of the of, of Burma, uh, the internet penetration is very, very low, uh, remembering in particular that Burma has all around its borders, um, you know, separatist movements going on. Okay, well, I, I think with that we do have to close, but I'd like to just finish off by saying, I think the key word here is shift. We, the shift is basically in, in everything, the shift in technology, the shift in society, the shift in politics, the shift in how we communicate uh, with each other. And I think, you know, with more of these shifts coming up and with the uh, inevitable migration to digitalization, I think we will see much more interesting days ahead of us, which will pose, you know, more challenges, but hopefully opportunities for us journalists. So we are not we're not going to be the dinosaurs of the past because, I mean, to be honest, everybody with an internet connection can now be a photographer, a journalist, a blogger, you know, and an opinion maker. So, you know, what we hope is that 
journalism, good journalism, is still relevant and it's still something that the public would want to see. Okay, with that, thank you very much, Maria, Ressa, Presham, Krishna, and Bambang. Thank you for an interesting discussion. And I would like to turn this program back to our organizer. Where is our organizer? What's next? <laughs> okay. All right, well, let's go and have coffee then. <laughs> <laughs>